I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The God revealed in Scripture is not an abstract idea, but God the Father, God the Almighty, and God the Creator, whom Christians love and worship. God is love. God is close. God calls us to love others. I believe. 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 Over the next four weeks, uh, Pastor Bruce over in the traditional and I over here in the contemporary will be going over the four main movements of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. I believe in the Holy Spirit, and I believe in the church. Now, as I've mentioned previously, this uh, sermon series is supplemented by a study. You may be sick of hearing us ask you to participate in that study, but we uh, encourage you to pick up a copy. If you're watching online, uh, please fill out a sign-up link. We will send you a PDF. What do you believe? It's amazing how much can be packed into just four small words. What do you believe? You'll notice I didn't say what do you know. Because knowledge is something that happens in our heads, and belief is something that happens in our hearts. And belief drives our actions far more than our knowledge does. Have you ever done something that you knew was maybe not in your best interest? We all have. Why do we do that? Maybe it's because we believe that the consequences of our actions won't actually catch up with us. Maybe it's because we know better that we feel we have the ability to choose what we do. However, when we truly believe something, we are compelled to act. Everything that we do stems from our deepest beliefs, even if those beliefs aren't even on the surface. And that is why the uh, author of Proverbs, writes, Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. What we believe influences the entirety of our lives and our thoughts, and most notably, our actions. And since belief is that important, we would be foolish not to be mindful about what we believe or even how we believe. Now, some things we believe because of how we were raised or where we are from, like uh, if you believe that it should be called soda and not pop. It's soda, by the way. Some things we believe because we've been taught them, either rightly or wrongly. For far too long, I believed that Alaska was an island because every map that a teacher ever handed me had Alaska in a small little box all off by itself in the corner. Some things we believe because they agree with what is known in sociology circles as plausibility structures. A plausibility structure are things that we believe because they sound true based on our experience of the world. And because I love language, and I used to be a teacher, and maybe you're preparing for your SATs, there's a $10 word for that. It's verisimilitude. So if you're planning for your SATs right now or studying for your SATs right now, 
you're welcome. We have examples of plausibility structures of things that sound true but aren't. Like you've probably heard that you can see the Great Wall of China from space. But you can't. Uh, maybe you grew up in church and you believe that there were three wise men who came to worship the baby Jesus in the manger, but the Bible never actually says that, even though it sounds true because of the songs and the way that we celebrate. There were three gifts, but there was probably entire entourages of wise men. We also have things that are true but violate our plausibility structures. Things like the fact that the rain cloud, on average, and we've had a lot of them here recently with all the flooding, weighs about a million pounds because of all the water that's in it. It doesn't sound true. They look up there so fluffy and light, but each one, on average, weighs more than a million pounds. And even though this is kind of unbelievable, we sent a man to step on the moon before we thought to put wheels on our luggage. It doesn't sound true, but it is true. Some things we believe, we don't even know that we believe until that belief begins to influence our actions. And even then, sometimes those things have to be pointed out to us. Like bad breath, sometimes we're unaware of what we truly believe unless somebody points it out to us. And we all have biases. A great deal of Jesus' ministry and his teaching was refining people's beliefs and plausibility structures. He set out to challenge what people believed about God and the status quo and what religious experts thought they knew about living out their faith. The apostles and the early church in particular were committed with preserving right belief because they understood that our belief fuels our lives. And we had better have a handle on what we believe, specifically what we believe about our being Christians. What makes us Christians? Now, in the early church, before the printing press, before most people could read, before people had their own Bibles or Bible apps or smartphones, the creeds were formulated to help instruct new believers and protect the church from false teaching. The Apostles' Creed itself is not found anywhere in Scripture in the formulation in which we have recited it here today. In just 100 words, it does not completely tell us everything about Christian belief or the totality of Christian teaching. There is a lot of variance in theology and traditions and practice and ways that we live out what we believe. The creed is focused on primary beliefs, not secondary beliefs, the basics, the what and not necessarily the how. As theologian R. Albert Moeller Jr. put it, all Christians believe more than is contained in the Apostles' Creed, but none can believe less. In our traditional service across the way, we recite the Apostles' Creed every week as a part of the liturgy to remind ourselves of the fundamentals. And hopefully, over the next four weeks, as we recite it together, you will come to appreciate it to be more than just something that's said in formal church settings. In our scripture passage this morning, Paul is in Athens, Greece, and he's walking around town, and his desire is to share the Christian faith with the people of Athens. And as he's touring the city, he notices that the people have a literal pantheon of gods and idols and deities that they worship. And he realizes that this Greek audience already has a cultural plausibility structure that acknowledges the presence of the divine. This is not a city of atheists. 
They have plenty of idols that they worship. And so Paul sets about to use this plausibility structure to appeal to them and to introduce the God of the Bible, the one true living God. And that's kind of a tall order, right? Like, how do you explain to an audience who's heard it all before or has a God for every other thing that the God of Scripture is unique and unlike the other things or gods or deities that people worship? And we, in America, live in a strikingly similar context. In our own culture, we have our share of atheists in the country, sure, But they are a minority compared to agnostics who haven't decided yet. And people who are disillusioned with Christianity because they've had a bad experience with the church or knew some Christians who didn't behave like Jesus or the rise of the nuns, those who want to be spiritual but not necessarily religious or bound to a corporate formal religion like Christianity. Our contemporary plausibility structure is like those of the people of Athens in that most people are willing to at least entertain the idea of a higher power, of the divine, of God. So let us see in Scripture how Paul explains the Almighty God to this group. Hear the word of the Lord as it is given to us in Acts chapter 17, verses 24 through 29. The God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath, and all things. From one ancestor he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth, and he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him, though indeed he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own poets have said, for we too are his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and the imagination of mortals. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Paul introduces the biblical God in the same way that the Apostles' Creed does. The Apostles' Creed says, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Paul says, the God who made the world and everything in it. He who is Lord of heaven and earth. The first claim of Christianity is that God is almighty. Another way of saying this is that he is transcendent, above and beyond all things. Theologian Stephen R. Holmes perhaps summed it up best when he wrote, What God is, is unspeakable in human language and unknowable by human minds. The task, however, is to find words adequate to God. So the language that we begin with when we talk about God as Christians is almighty, is transcendent, all-powerful, holy other. The human mind cannot comprehend the fullness of God any more than one could wrap their mind around the vastness of the cosmos or the intricacies of quantum physics. As Paul explains, he is the Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. 
God cannot be contained in our heads or our buildings or our language. God is inconceivably bigger than us and yet still desires to have a relationship with each and every one of us. And so he provides us with concepts that we can understand like metaphors and illusions which reveal parts and fragments of his character. And this is why the creed uses paternal imagery. Every human being on the face of the planet has a father. It's an image with universal appeal. Everyone understands the idea of a father. I believe in God, the Father Almighty. God is not like our fallible human fathers. God is the epitome of what fatherhood is should be. God is the perfect parent. And if God is our parent, then our relationship to God is that of children. Again, this is a universally understood image. We are dependent upon God. The way that children depend on their parents for provision and protection and safety, and the crafting of how they see the world. Paul says, it is God who gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. And just like a parent, God knows more than us. Even though our children sometimes want to think they know more than their parents, we know better. And this fact that God knows more than us, that he can see things from a grander perspective outside of space and time should lead us to trust God the way that young children inherently trust their parents. Ideally, parents are bonded to their children. They delight in them and want the best for them. And similarly, God desires a deep connection with every one of us. And he wants the best for all of his children. And that's not an image that our culture frequently embraces in this country. So many people have this notion that God is is distant and far away and punitive and angry, just looking for excuses and reasons to smite us and make our lives go poorly. But Paul clarifies, indeed, he is not far from each one of us. 1 John 4, 16 through 19 tells us, God is love. Those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. There is no fear in love. Complete love drives out fear. Fear has to do with punishment. And anyone who is afraid has not been completed in love. We love. Because he first loved us. God is love. God is close. And God calls us to love others as he has loved us. The image of God the Father is most familiar to us because of how Jesus talks about God in the New Testament. It's in the New Testament that we see the depth of God's love for his children. God sent Jesus to live among us as love incarnate, and that love bore all of our shame and sin, that we might find everlasting favor in the eyes of our Heavenly Father. As Paul tells us, from one ancestor he made all peoples to inhabit the whole earth and he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live so that they would search for God and perhaps grope or fumble about and find him, though indeed he is not far from each one of us. God is intentional in how he interacts with us. 
And if you've been around for any time at all, you have heard me say and you will continue to hear me say that you are not where you are by accident, but by divine appointment. And how you respond to each moment is up to you. Which brings us to the next clause of the first line of the Apostles' Creed. God is the maker of heaven and earth. And we just read from Paul, he made all peoples to inhabit the whole earth. Same wavelength, right? As a core tenet of the Christian faith, the Apostles' Creed declares that it is God who is maker of both heaven and earth. John 1.3 says elsewhere, All things, all things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. And this includes everything that you can see and everything that you can't see. Reality as you know it has been handcrafted by God. And this is important because it demonstrates God's intentionality and God's affection for us, his children. Like God thought up gravity to keep us from flying off the face of the earth. God set the position of every celestial body and every subatomic particle and actively governs their behavior. Take a moment. Pause for just a moment and think of something that you enjoy. Anything at all. Something that you really enjoy. Whatever it is, the core of that thing is a gift From God to us, those who bear his image and his likeness, his children. God has given us these things because as a good father, he wants to give his children gifts. Do you like a day at the beach, the waves lapping at the surf? Can't you just see God setting the moon right where it needed to be and spinning it just slightly around the earth and then setting the oceans where they are and going that this gravity from the moon will pull the waves and it will pull it up onto shore and and they can set an umbrella and the sunshine will rain down on them and they can watch their children play in the surf And they will be thankful. They'll love that. Oh, they'll love that. Every deep and meaningful relationship you've had with another person, God's fingerprints are all over that. God wants us to be in healthy community for our flourishing. Every amazing meal that you've ever had. You know the ones, right? Where it's so good, you walk away from the restaurant or the table and you go, that's it, I don't think you can top it. That's the best I've ever had. God created the ingredients and the creativity in the mind of the chef to produce that meal. Not only that, but God invented flavor. You're welcome. Every good book, every inspiring painting, every great movie, or every compelling song. God has gifted the creativity for those things to take shape. And this is why Paul tells us this morning, for in him we live and we move and we have our very being. The mistake that much of the ancient world made, the people in Athens. And the mistake that we run the risk of making, we here in America, is worshiping the things that have been created. The gifts, rather than the creator and the gift giver. God gave us all the gifts of life and creation with the intention of drawing us back to himself so that we would experience all that God created and turn to our heavenly Father and thank him and ascribe him glory. 
every good and amazing thing we enjoy designed to draw our eyes off of that thing and up towards our good heavenly father. Creation is a revelation of God's power and presence and paternity. And this reality demands a response like a fire in your kitchen. Creation begs the question of where we will direct our worship and our adoration. Will we look towards our loving Heavenly Father? Will we worship Him? Or will we look and worship the things that He's made? Will we give God the glory that is due, or will we cling to the notion that all that we see and know and experience is just a matter of happenstance? What do you believe? What do you believe? Would you please pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we rejoice in the fact that you not only made this world and filled it with beauty, but you made us and placed us right where we are. Help us to see your fingerprints in this world that you made and in this life that you have given to us. Help us to live our lives in ways that testify that we believe you are in control and looking out for us. Prompt our hearts to offer you the appropriate gratitude and glory as we encounter your creation. Remind us that it is in you that we live and move and have our very being. Remind us that we are enveloped in a kind of love that only you are capable of. In the most precious and holy name of Jesus, amen.